So when you put the words Islam and democracy or Muslim world and democracy uh, together, you often get a number of different reactions. Just the fact that we put this conference on, you can see the reactions around, uh, around this place. Now, some would argue that the two are incompatible, while others would argue there is no inherent contradiction, and nor, nor, nor should there be. When you speak to governments um, and politicians across the uh, so-called Muslim world, some of, of those in the, say, the Gulf states will say, well, that as long as they provide wealth, jobs and, peop and, and food, people don't really need democracy. They, act, they actually just want comfort and the basics in life. In other countries where democracy has been tried, some people bemoan what they see as weak government when they feel that politicians spend too much time <laughs> arguing rather than delivering solutions to problems. Is it, no, is it any wonder that they then look, look for strong men or strong uh, leaders? Then there's a problem of what we call dictatorial majorities. So where, where you have democratic elections, but a majority suppresses the rights of the minorities or rigs elections or undermines uh, opposition parties and movements. Now, of course, those of us who debate these issues will say, well, the answer is clearly lib liberal democracy. And, we, and I hope that's one of the issues that we can discuss today. A former US president, and it's, there's a, a bit of a dispute about whoever it was, said, was quoted as saying, they are all bastards, but at least they are our bastards. And some feel that this has often been governed, this doctrine has governed Western policy in its attitude towards the uh, Muslim world and also particularly the Middle East. In addition, some of our countries have taken a hypocritical, a hypocritical view of democracy <coughs> when the populace of a Muslim majority country has elected a government or elected politicians that they don't like, quite often turn the blind eye to results being ignored or democratic governments being elected. You know, over the years, you can think of debates around the overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran in 53, or the cancellation of the 1991 Algerian elections after the Salvation Front won, or the Sisi coup in Egypt, and maybe other examples. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that. It's not black and white. There were clearly strategic and security concerns behind these decisions. But we have to admit that these incidents were not a democracy's finest moments. Despite this, there have been a number of democracies or emergency, emerging democracies in the uh, Muslim world. And for the purposes of this conference today, and you may want to debate this and, and challenge this, let's define those as countries having Muslim majorities where democratic elections have occurred and the losing government has peacefully given up power and the election winner has, ta uh, election winner has, has taken uh, power. Of course, you can argue that the Muslim world should include Muslim minorities in non-Muslim countries, especially since there are elements in many of these communities that criticise democracy as being anti-Islam. Those of us who are Muslims and have stood for elections in many of these countries have come in for criticism for um, taking part in democratic elections. But I don't necessarily want that to be the main focus of the conference today. I, wa let's, how can we, I want to look more to Muslim-majority countries. So we can argue about which countries come under this category. And so let me be rather provocative and suggest some countries that we might want to consider. Many of you are from these countries. So you can include countries such, such as Algeria, Indonesia, Malaysia, Maldives, Pakistan, Tunisia, Morocco. Some would add Bangladesh and Jordan to this list, where others would argue against this. In addition, um, clearly uh, um, there have been elections in Bangladesh, <coughs> Egypt, Turkey, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Iraq and Iran. But if they, can you really say that these have been free and fair elections? Could you, do you really want to hold these up as examples of democracy? Last night when I was having a conversation with uh, Ali Salman and Bilal, they came up with the, this idea of liberal democracy, but also procedural democracies or formal democracies, where there are, they, they've gone through the process of democracy and had elections, but are they really free and fair? You know, are, are, have, have there been fair, fair oppositions? Can, can you, are they, do they tolerate minorities? Are they liberal democracies in any way? Now, I hope this conference will discuss these issues, focuses, focusing on these countries, where uh, Muslim majority countries, where they, are, where they are democracies. One of the reasons that this is very important to me is one, as a leader of one of the largest political groups in the European Parliament, and someone who's a Muslim, I see no inherent contradiction between Islam and liberal democracy. But is that because I'm, I'm westernised? Is that because is that a Eurocentric view, or you no? Know, what, let's, let's debate this issue. There will be others who will disagree and say, well, actually, there are other concerns that trump democracy. People will talk about security concerns. They'll talk about foreign policy concerns. There will be other concerns. And therefore, you know, that, that might reduce the importance of liberal democracy when we consider these issues. 
It is my hope that, the, that today's conference will discuss these issues, discuss some of the trade-offs, whether you are from one of these countries or whether you are looking at it from a very much a Western perspective and a foreign policy perspective. And how can we encourage more Muslim-majority countries to take the path towards being liberal democracies? And it's my hope today as well that when we have these conversations, that we think about that this should not just be the first conference and that's it, and, we have, and we've talked about it. How do we continue this conversation? How do we continue to encourage countries which are Muslim-majority countries to make that transition towards democracy? How do we encourage those countries that have actually had elections, but what we would probably call formal democracies or procedural democracies rather than liberal democracies, to make that transition? And how do we encourage leaders in those other countries who say, well, we don't need democracy in, in our country because our people are happy? Maybe they see themselves as benign leaders or benign dictators. How do we encourage that transition to liberal democracy? So let's move on to the uh, uh, first um, session today. Um, but I'll quickly run through the other sessions before we start. Uh, we've got democracies in the Muslim world, interp reinterpretations of Islam and institution building reform. We have liberal democracy and minority rights, the role of education, religion, and cultural rapprochement. Emerging markets in the Muslim world, investment, trade, and international development. Stability, security, cooperation, peace building, and conflict resolution. Improving social integration by investing in uh, uh, human capital and education. And the enormous potential of youth and women entrepreneurship. And finally, we'll wrap up the conference with the future relationship between Europe and Muslim democracies. If you are not from, if you are not from Europe, say you, you, you say you're from North America or elsewhere, you can consider that in the context of, say, the West if you like, in its broadest terms, and Muslim democracies. Let me ask two requests um, as we go through the day. Think about this idea of democracy, liberal democracy, as we go through these panels, and how, that, uh, how you have that balance. But also, can I ask you to be courteous to each other, but not necessarily polite? And what I mean by that is, if you disagree with someone, please feel free to challenge them. Let's, I think we'll get more out of this conference if we have a proper debate rather than simply nod uh, you know, politely when people say something. And let's, argue, let's, let's, have, a, let's have a debate. Um, as uh, those, who, those of you who, who are scholars of Islam will know about the whole debate about the gates of Ijtihad being closed 500 years ago, well, I've always felt that we should blast them wide open. Um, and I'm sure many of you in this room uh, will agree. And as I said also to, throughout the day, think if you feel this is a worthwhile initiative, how can we continue this conversation? Can we continue? Uh, we've brought a number of people together from across the world. Could we continue this discussion as a network of some form to continue this uh, and encourage this path towards uh, liberal democracy?